Offshore oil rigs are easily some of the most dangerous places to work. They're isolated, usually high up off the water, and the tiniest spark of fire can make the entire thing explode in seconds. A hard hat might not be enough to protect you there. Even though it might seem that knowing how dangerous they are, there would be so many checks and balances in place that accidents would be rare. But in reality, that's not the case. There have been several extremely deadly oil rig disasters throughout history, and one just happened a few days ago. In this video, we'll be going over five of the oil rig disasters the world has ever suffered. The World's Oil Rig Disasters and the recent case of the Belongan Fire. Oh ya, yeah. untuk kalian yang lebih nyaman dengan bahasa Indonesia, bisa nyalakan subtitle terjemahannya ya. Number 5. Piper Alpha, North Sea, United Kingdom The Piper Alpha disaster of 1988 is the most devastating offshore oil rig disaster in history. The oil rig was first set up in 1976. It was the biggest offshore oil rig in the UK and one of the biggest ones in the world. This oil rig alone was producing about 10% of the total crude oil the UK produced as a whole. Each day, they'd make a little over 300,000 barrels. That shows us just how busy the rig was every day. Workers didn't really have time to talk to each other. It was work, work, work until the 6th of July, 1988. There was a routine inspection early on in the day, and the workers had to remove the condensate injection pump to make sure everything was working properly and sealed it back up using a temporary seal made with two blind hinges. However, after their shift was over, they simply left it there and forgot all about it. The night staff began their duty and went to work as they normally would, not knowing that the seal wasn't in place properly and that the pump couldn't be used. But that was supposed to be okay because there was another pump there, but it malfunctioned. Unaware of the danger, they turned on the pump, and there was a leak of gas condensate. The leak ended up causing fires and explosions throughout the entire platform. Within minutes, the entire platform was destroyed. The fire burned for another three weeks before it was finally put out. Out of the 225 workers on board, only 61 made it out alive, and that too, with injuries and trauma that would last them a lifetime. The platform was managed by Occidental Petroleum, and apart from the devastating loss of crew, the loss of the facility ended up being worth around $1.4 billion. Number 4. Alexander Al Keeland, North Sea, Norway Oil rig disasters aren't always due to an operational error. Sometimes, the design of the rig itself leaves it vulnerable to the elements, and with it, putting the lives of everyone on it in danger. This is what happened with the Alexander Al Keeland oil platform in 1980. Alexander Al Keeland was a semi-submerged accommodation platform. Instead of being super high above the waters, it was attached to the main production platform, ADA 27C, and stood on five legs. On the 27th of March, 1980, the weather got rough. There was rain, heavy mist, the wind was strong, blowing at around 40 knots, with rough waves that went up to 12 meters high. But it was the sea. The workers didn't think much of it and thought they'd be fine in their rooms. But they weren't. At around 6.30 p.m., when most of the crew was off duty, relaxing in their rooms, they heard a crack and right after felt some kind of trembling. Before they could even register what was happening, the entire platform began tilting. Fast. Within a few seconds, it had already tilted 35 to 40 degrees. Six anchor cables were there to help the platform stay stable, but as the platform tilted, five of them broke, one after the other. The crew tried to make it to the lifeboats, but there were too many of them and too little time. At exactly 6.53, the last anchor cable snapped too, and the platform went into the water. Out of the 212 workers on board Alexander Al Keeland, only 89 were able to make it out alive. Investigation showed that the reason for the disaster was an undetected fatigue crack in the weld of an instrument connection on the bracing, which led to the first leg breaking and consequently the entire platform's destruction. 
Number 3. Deepwater Horizon Disaster, Gulf of Mexico Deepwater Horizon explosion is still the biggest oil spill in the history of the United States. It was an ultra-deepwater, semi-submersible offshore drilling wreck. It had just finished drilling a 13,000-foot-long exploration well in the Mississippi Canyon and had been moved to 5,000 feet deep waters on the Gulf of Mexico on the BP, British Petroleum-operated Macondo Prospect. On the 20th of April, 2010, the day went on as usual. But as night fell, there was a sudden influx of natural gas, which ended up blasting through the main concrete core of the rig. The rig had just recently been installed and was used so they could seal the well until they wanted to use it again. The concrete core wasn't strong enough to hold the pressure of the gas in and exploded. The explosion instantly killed 11 crew members on board, injuring another 11. Within the next 48 hours, the entire rig had capsized and had sunk into the water. As it tilted, it ruptured a riser that had been filled with drilling mud to keep the pressure of gas down. Without anything in its way to hold it down, the oil began flowing directly into the gulf, uncontrolled. It was later found that at peak pressure, 60,000 barrels a day had leaked into the waters. The spill continued for a staggering 87 days until the well was sealed again. In total, 170,000 tons of natural gas was spilled into the ocean, which makes this the biggest oil spill in history. BP initially suffered a loss of $350 million, which was how much the rig was to build, but the loss didn't end there. Over the next five years, BP had to spend $14 billion on cleanup alone, $1 billion for early restoration of natural resources, and $1.3 billion on the process of natural resource damage assessment. Additionally, they also paid $6.67 billion to a trust fund that they established to settle all the claims that were brought on by the accident itself. There was also a $18.7 billion settlement for a decree that had been finalized by the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana. In total, apart from the loss of the 11 workers that died in the accident, BP had to pay $65 billion for the accident. Numerous investigations explored the causes of the explosion and record-setting spill. The U.S. government report, published in September 2011, pointed to defective cement on the well, faulting mostly BP, but also rig operator Transocean and contractor Halliburton. Earlier in 2011, a White House commission likewise blamed BP and its partners for a series of cost-cutting decisions and an inadequate safety system, but also concluded that the spill resulted from systemic root causes and absent significant reform in both industry practices and government policies might well recur. Number 2. Glomar Java Sea Drillship Disaster, South China Sea In 1975, the Levingston Shipbuilding Company of Orange, Texas, built the 5,930-ton Glomar Java Sea Drillship and sent it over to Global Marine. The drill ship was huge, measuring 400 feet in length. It was capable of drilling 25,000 feet deep wells and could function easily in 1,000 feet deep waters. It was a beast. For a little over five years, the drill ship operated just off the coast of California, but in January of 1983, it moved over to the South China Sea. On the 25th of October, 1983, the crew shut down operation as the tropical storm Lax was approaching and it wouldn't have been safe to keep the drill functioning. However, as the storm got closer to the drilling site, the crew realized that they might not be safe with the drills off either. The winds had picked up. They were blowing at 138.9 kilometers an hour. Global Marine's office in Houston was contacted by the assistant rig manager who was on board. He informed them about the winds and told them that the ship had already tilted by 15 degrees. He specified that they had no idea why the ship was tilting since all the anchors were in place. Then, he said that all of the crew on board was up and wearing life jackets, prepared for the ship to go under. Before the Houston office could do anything to help them, the call disconnected and they lost all contact with the drill ship. According to the clocks that were found from the ship later on, it was 11.35 p.m 
when the entire ship capsized. The ship was found overturned 1,600 feet southwest of the drilling site. Out of the 84 personnel on board, only the bodies of 36 of them were found. This didn't include any of the senior personnel. Since the ship had overturned and a lot of the top had been buried in the mud so deep that it was life-threatening for rescuers to go to, it has been assumed that the senior personnel were either in the buried pilot house, the radio room, or the manager's office. None of the 42 bodies were ever found, and they're all presumed dead. To this day, there isn't a confirmation on what caused the ship to capsize. One plausible reason is that the crew on board simply didn't know how to correct a list. This was because the Marine Operations Manual didn't have the section printed in it that went over the protocol, and the connection was lost before anyone could tell the crew how to do it over the call either. It could have also been the tension in the moorings adjusting malfunctioning that could have caused the ship to roll and capsize out of control. However, the reports just say that the cause was inconclusive. Number 1. Belongan Fire, West Java Province, Indonesia The Belongan Refinery is one of the most important refineries in Indonesia. Not only is it one of the largest ones in the entire country, but it is also responsible for providing most of the fuel and petrochemicals to Jakarta. It's been functional since the mid-90s and is one of the strongest oil refineries in Indonesia, capable of refining 125,000 barrels every single day. For the past two decades, the refinery had been functioning perfectly. But at 12.45 a.m. on the 29th of March, 2021, things took a turn. A massive fire broke out in the refinery's T-301G tank. It wasn't a silent fire. There was a loud explosion that shook the village nearby, and all of the 1,000 residents in the local area had to be immediately evacuated to a camp amid the coronavirus pandemic. According to the local disaster agency, the explosion was so loud and terrifying that one person lost his life to a heart attack, while 15 people were left injured. All the staff at the facility left unhurt. The entire Belongan refinery area was engulfed in flames and had a giant black cloud hovering above it as the firefighters fought the blaze as the fire spread to other parts of the refinery. The refinery was immediately shut down in an effort to put out the fire and to keep the rest of the facility from blowing up too. Up until now, there isn't a confirmed report on what caused the fire, but according to Pertamina, the company under which the refinery operates, it could have been struck by lightning because of the major storms in the area. Locals in the area reported that they smelled what they think was a major gas leak before the initial explosion, pointing to the fact that there might have been something wrong at the facility before the storm hit. In total, Pertamina lost four out of their 72 storage tanks, and the main processing plant has been left untouched, so they will only stay shut for four to five days. However, Greenpeace International has called for a full investigation into the incident so that they can rule out any foul play, saying that these kinds of dangerous incidents have been happening repeatedly in fossil fuel industries. If there's any evidence of negligence or a violation of health and safety procedures, the government must file criminal charges to hold Pertamina accountable. The question why? There's a pattern with all of these disasters. They were all either because of an operational failure, where the crew was faced with a situation they did not understand, they did something that they seemed small but led to a massive disaster, or there was something bigger at play, the design of the rig itself. Precious lives were lost. Companies lost billions of dollars, and the environmental damage is something we can't even calculate. Companies that are permitted to operate offshore oil rigs need to do better. These disasters should stand as examples. There needs to be a better planning from the initial design of the rigs and the training of the crew to thinking of the setting that the rig is going to be functioning in. If the rig is going to be in an area with strong winds, it needs to be able to function without a problem. Most of the disastrous events at oil rigs could have been avoided had the companies planned well enough to protect the platforms. And train their crews for the absolute worst. These events can be used as examples of disasters that could happen so they can be avoided in the future.
Many oil and gas companies now have applied environmental risk assessment technology and other consequential measurements to every international business decision, and the public has strong beliefs that these have been enhanced from time to time. We were deeply saddened to learn of all these disasters. Our thoughts and prayers are with the victims. And together, let's do our best in every field we're working in, because every act can make a difference for the livelihood of many people.